Good morning, and welcome to today's CHCF briefing on price transparency. My name is Catherine Rodriguez. I'm a program officer with the state program office here in Sacramento of the California Healthcare Foundation. We're delighted to see you all here today. I know it's cold, and so we're glad you all came out and joined us for lunch, and which should be a very interesting briefing. CHCF is an independent philanthropy dedicated to improving healthcare delivery and health outcomes. We are based in Oakland and we support innovations and ideas that improve quality, increase efficiency, and lower the costs of care. Today's convening is one in a regular series of briefings we sponsor for Sacramento policy, policy staff and other interested persons. The briefings are designed to bring you information relevant to key healthcare issues and trends and to increase the dialogue on possible solutions to challenges facing state policymakers. Today's event is being videotaped and will be available on the web in a couple days if you'd like to go back and, and look. We're also webcasting and we have an open phone line. Both of those are on listen only mode. I'd like to just um, ask at the end of the briefing if you wouldn't mind filling out the evalu evaluation form in your packet. It's the bright pink form. It always helps inform us for future briefings. We have three distinguished speakers today. I will just briefly introduce them and their full bios are in our packets as well. First, we have Mary Beth Shannon, who is the director of California Healthcare Foundation's Market and Policy Monitor Program, which promotes greater transparency and accountability in California's healthcare system. Next, we have Dr. Jill Yagan. She leads policy and research at the Integrated Healthcare Association. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Adams Dudley. He's a professor of medicine and health policy and the associate director for research at UCSF's Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mary Beth to kick us off. Thank you. So um, my job this morning, or this afternoon, I guess by five minutes, is to set the stage and identify kind of what the problem is that we've identified and what it is that we're trying to solve. Um, and then Jill's going to go a little bit more in depth on the different audiences for price transparency information and how we might be able to meet those needs. Um, and then Adam's going to talk about options in California and some examples from other states that have tackled this problem already. So I was looking for some way of sort of teeing this up, and there have been lots and lots of analogies of healthcare and why pricing is so obscure and difficult to get in healthcare. Um, so in this example that I pulled was one of, you know, if you drove up to a gas pump and you didn't know if you were going to pay $3 or $30. But I think it's actually even worse than that, because you wouldn't even know how many gallons you needed or whether or not the octane was right. You know, the services that are provided may be recommended by a physician based on their particular point of view. You may decide you need those all of those services or you don't. Some of those are optional. We've done lots of work on variation in terms of elective procedures um, and find that across the country it's much more what the physician thinks you need or how many uh, gallons they might think you would need uh, versus what you actually do need for the particular condition you have. So um, this is a, has been an age-old problem in healthcare and one where I think the time is really ripe to start to tackle it. I wanted to start off with some key terms, because when we talk about pricing information, it means different things to different people. So when we're talking about charges today, we're talking about essentially retail amounts, the total amount that's billed to a patient, the amount that's carried on a claim or a claim for initial claim form. Um, but when we talk about price or allowed amounts, there it's the negotiated amount between any two contracting parties, so a hospital and a health plan, a medical group and a health plan. Out of pocket, here we have actually the patient's responsibility, so what they actually paid for the service. This is usually known after the fact versus uh, ahead of time. And then the uh, last one is cost, which in, when we use cost here, we're going to be talking about the actual cost to deliver the care. So uh, Covered California, I think, was able to really shed some light on this issue of variation in prices across the state. So I just pulled plans from two regions, from Los Angeles and San Francisco, to just give an example of how differences in health care costs and prices drive differences in premiums. So it's much less relevant which plan you pick in Los Angeles 
as is that you're in Los Angeles in terms of determining what the price is going to be for a particular plan. In San Francisco, the average price is 381. This happens to be for a single um, a silver plan for a single 40-year-old woman um, with $75,000 in income. So there's no subsidy at play here. Um, but in Los Angeles, it would only be $258. So the bars show there's not much variation between plans. The real difference is where you're located. So what's driving those differences? Um, clearly, there's some utilization element of it, but there's a lot of price difference between these two locations. So this is just an example of the average price of a hospital stay. Um, the top line is San Francisco, $7,740. The bottom line is Los Angeles at $4,292. These come from our friends at Oshpid, um, and it's based on all third-party payers. So there's huge variation in the average price in these regions, but if we were to actually look at the different prices that the hospitals charge within the region, you'd see even more variation. Um, you'd find some hospitals in Los Angeles that have prices higher than hospitals in San Francisco. And again, here I'm talking about price, so it's the amount they actually got, not the, the gross charges. And here's a third view of this difference. And this comes from the Integrated um, Healthcare Association. And Jill can talk a little bit more about this. But it's differences in total costs of care. So here it's looking at, for a group that's involved in managed care business, what their average member year cost of care is. And we have um, three columns, 2011, 2010, and then the difference to show the increase in trend. And of course, what's, again, dramatic is the difference in what you'll pay in the Bay Area and Sacramento versus what you're going to pay in Los Angeles, um, and the fact that those rates are changing at different, um, different rates of change as well. So what drives these differences in provider prices, and what might price transparency help shed some light on? So the first is just pure differences in market power and competition. In LA, it's a very fragmented hospital market. There are many, many, many hospitals that are willing to contract for services, and that provides kind of a buyer's market. Um, whereas in San Francisco, it's a much more consolidated hospital market. And then, of course, health plan market strength comes into play as well. If you have a market where you have a particular health plan that, that covers many and many, many members in that area, they'll also have a lot of leverage with regard to what those negotiated rates will end up being. Payment methodology. We actually had a briefing about six weeks ago or so on uh, payment reform, and we talked a little bit more there about the differences in payment methodologies and how that drives. So it's not only the amount that you pay, but what incentives are in place to control overall costs and control uh, referral services, et cetera. And so capitation and per diem payments are examples here of the payment methodology differences. The technology arms race, so um, many, many Providers in communities want to be competitive. They want to attract patients, and they may be purchasing technology um, at different rates, which is, of course, all building into higher costs and therefore higher negotiated rates with health plans um, and patient mix. And cost shifting has for a long time been described as one of the key uh, drivers in differences in payment, because you have some hospitals, for example, that end up caring for a lot of uninsured patients, and they end up cost shifting to health plans in order to cover that, essentially shifting from under-covered to, um, to health plans that may have a bit richer plan. But I wanted to point to this article that came out a couple of months ago. This was done by Chapin White at the Center for Studying Health System Change. Um, and I'll take this opportunity to say there's a resource list in your packages. And what we've done is we've made some copies of these articles that are available for you as you leave. Um, there's a little number corresponding to each article that's in the resource list. So that if you want to pick up a copy of this article or some of the others that are mentioned, you, should, you can be able to pick them up on your way out today. But this article that was done by the Center for Studying Health System Change looked at what happens when Medicare slows its rate of payment to hospitals. What do the hospitals do? Do they shift to other health plan contractors, or do they end up reducing their costs? And the answer is they reduce their costs. And it makes perfect sense, because I would argue most hospitals are already maximizing the amount that they can get in a contract. And so it's based on what their market share is, what the market share of the health plan they're negotiating with is. And so they get the rate, essentially, that the market will bear. Um, and so if they end up having a reduction in costs from Medicare, from Medi-Cal, from any other public payer, they're not able to increase that by getting a higher amount from their health insurance that they're negotiating with. They've already maximized that amount, and they really have no choice but to actually cut their overall costs. And that's what this article has proven. So it's, a, it's sort of an interesting question of whether the era of cost shifting is really over. 
So I wanted to tee up a couple of different audiences that would benefit from price transparency. And um, both uh, Jill and Adams will talk a little bit more about this in their pieces as well. So the first is about consumers shopping. This is probably the most common application that's described, that consumers are going looking for um, an imaging test, and they have no idea what the price available to them would be. Health insurer negotiations. Um, health insurers know what they pay different hospitals, but they don't know what other insurers pay different hospitals. Um, employer price calibration. Probably the best example here is the CalPERS work that was done with hip and knee replacements and the tremendous savings that were achieved by essentially capping prices, looking at what the prices were across the state and identifying places that would deliver it for less than $30,000. and not requiring CalPERS members go there, but um, capping their CalPERS liability and members would be responsible for paying the balance. And studies of this have shown that the benefit is that not only would people go to those hospitals that, that have the lower price, but the hospitals with the higher price points actually lowered their prices to meet it. There were almost more savings that came from hospitals lowering their price than from those that were actually um, in the network initially, in the initial small network. And then the fourth item is policymaker needs. There are lots of reasons why all of the people in this room would have some interest in getting access to prices and understanding the market better. You can better assess how different changes in policy and regulation might affect the overall market if you really had a better understanding of what all of these costs were. And I just wanted to give this chart, which is impossible to read, but it's part of the um, CHCF Employer Benefits Survey. And the, uh, the two sets of bars, the bottom line on the top is California 2012. And what it shows is that the, the first red bar, I'll just go in, in rough uh, numbers here, that's 55% of Californians with employer-sponsored spon health insurance are covered in HMOs. So they actually have a very limited price liability and responsibility because they usually have copays or, or fixed deductibles, but they don't have a lot of price exposure. And so over half of Californians in being in HMO plans don't have a lot of price sensitivity. But the yellow and green bars at the bottom, those are PPO, point of service, and the very last section is high deductible health plans. And we only have 5% of Californians as of 2012 in high deductible health plans. So we have about 45% of the population that is cost sensitive in some way, because even those who are in PPO plans are cost sensitive. Their coinsurance will vary based on the provider that they choose. Um, so we think that there are a fair number of people who would benefit from the consumer side. The numbers on the bottom, the four lines on the bottom, are in the national numbers. Um, and so you can see, perhaps there, the green bar is much bigger. In, in nationally, 19% of people are in high deductible health plans. So I'm just finishing up here. I wanted to recognize that we have many price transparency efforts going on in California, and we're not going to be specific about any one of these today, but I just wanted to identify them. Um, the Integrated Healthcare Association, where Jill's from, um, they've done a number of things working with health plans and medical groups about prices and total cost of care. The California Healthcare Performance, um, um, Performance Information System, CHIPI, also known as CHIPI, which is a voluntary multi-payer plan. Um, it has three health plans that are contributing information. But the most significant, I have a little asterisk here, is there's not actually pricing information in this database. So it's primarily being used for development of quality measures and utilization measures, but not actual price. The third is there is a budding industry in looking at how they c we can develop crowdsourced pricing tools. So these are applications or websites where people would actually go on, put in what came out of their last EOB, the prices that come on their explanation of benefits, and actually attempting to build a database that way, which is kind of an interesting approach. Um, there are at least four or five of those going on in California right now. And then I wanted to clearly identify the public sector initiatives. The California Department of Insurance, which had issued a, re a request for information, those responses were due last week. So it'll be very interesting to see what comes out of that and how the $5.2 million federal grant will be spent. And then lastly, an all-pair claims database is part of the state innovation model plan. Um, it's one of the building blocks that's been identified. So all of these efforts are going on simultaneously. And what we were hoping today was to establish some sort of ground rules that might inform all of those efforts. 
And so my very last slide, I wanted to tee up some questions for my fellow panelists. Um, what we hope to get today is what can, pr how, what can price transparency help us do? What are the actual sort of use cases in play that we really think w price transparency will help inform? What can we learn from others, particularly other states who've gone down this path already? And what can we do that will help us shape what we have, have our tasks ahead in California to create additional price transparency? So let me turn it over to Jill Yegan. Good afternoon. I'm really pleased to be here. Fantastic um, topic, and I think Mary Beth did a terrific job um, framing up the issues. I just wanted to take a minute, for those of you who are not familiar with the Integrated Healthcare Association, to give you sort of a high-level snapshot. Uh, we're a statewide group, multi-stakeholder, and uh, we work towards promoting quality, affordability, and accountability uh, for healthcare in California tons of information about us and our products and what we do at IHA.org. So my charge today is to really drill down a bit on a couple of those audiences um, that Mary Beth talked about, primarily consumers and purchasers, uh, and to some extent providers as well. On the consumer side, we'll talk a little bit about priorities, information, and the effect of information and incentives on behavior. On the purchaser side, we're really going to be focusing a little bit more drilling down on total cost of care, uh, and that uh, uh, presents a distinct um, view uh, between what the purchasers are interested in versus what consumers are interested in. So beginning with the consumer audience, the question really is, I think, that we want to ask ourselves before sort of launching in to price transparency initiatives uh, that we are thinking are going to meet consumer needs is, what do consumers want? And a fair bit of work has been done um, on this. Uh, this. These are key takeaways that come uh, from some work that uh, I did while at the American Institute's for research with Mary Beth and others, it is number two on your resource list. Uh, so I'd encourage you to read it in detail if you are particularly interested in this. What I want to highlight for today is that consumers really are all about me. They're really interested in their own doc, and in particular in the patient experience of their own doc, and the cost information that they want is, again, it's all about me. They really aren't interested in global, resource use measures for a geographic area. Don't care. They want to know when I go to my doctor and I have my deductible and I want this service, what's it going to cost me? That's what they want to know. Uh, and in particular, it's also helpful to know that the integration of cost and quality in terms of presenting information to consumers is very important. And lab studies have shown that when you show consumers information about cost without any information about quality, they tend to assume that those low-cost docs are also going to be low-quality docs. I'm not going to go into the principles of effective presentation. Suffice it to say, they are very important in delivering messages to consumers and very inconsistently applied in the information that we see delivered around us. So I'm going to read this slide. No, I'm not going to read this slide. Um, this is to remind me of the point I wanted to make here, which is that there is a really sharp distinction to be made. And this is an exhibit from uh, the article that is um, resource number two in your packet list. There's a really sharp distinction to be made between the traditional world of public reporting. And the focus there is really on quality improvement and even in cost reduction, performance improvement. And what we call, we call that transparency uh, for the greater good in the article. And I want to distinguish that between very personalized, individualized information for consumers that fits those priorities that I just talked about. It's about me. It's about my doc, my deductible, my benefit design, my network design. And we call that in the article one-stop shopping. And these are um, th the key thing I want to really try to convey from this is to get you all thinking about when you're trying to meet the information needs for consumers for decision making, who has that information? Who has that benefit design information, network design information? What health plan are they in? What product are they in? Who's their doc? What's the negotiated rate for that doc, for that service? And really, it's the health plan. 
that has that information. So the health plan and the partners of the health plan, uh, or if it's a self-insured employer, that self-insured employer and whoever that uh, company partners with in terms of a TPA or an insurance company or a cast light, uh, that's who's gonna have that data. So when you're thinking about meeting consumer needs, you need to really be thinking about what the consumer wants and who has the data to meet those needs. And I should mention in passing that here in the last slide in this one, I'm really talking about insured consumers. Uninsured consumers are a whole different ball game. Uh, really important, although we hope sort of increasingly um, uh, problematic in terms of coverage as 1114 comes around and we shift from having so many uninsured in this state uh, to, um, to fewer. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time and essentially go to a sort of high level tour, quick and dirty tour of um, recent and current research on basically the link between price transparency and consumer behavior. And I'm gonna go quickly through three articles, um, two of which have come out uh, this year and I are, believe are on your list. Um, the second one is not on your list, but I can give you the reference. Um, and the third one is not out yet. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the effect of deductibles um, on shopping behavior, the effect of reference pricing on consumer choice. Mary Beth talked a little bit about that already. And then consumer use of an all payer claims database. And what I want you to be thinking about is that as I review this research and kind of tried to frame it up in my mind to make it make sense, what struck me was that when you think about the effect of high deductibles on shopping behavior, you really Really talking about a situation where you have incentives based on your benefit design, but you don't have information. And when you're thinking about all payer claims databases, you have information, but you really don't have incentives. And it's possible that the sweet spot there is reference pricing and consumer choice, where you have both information and incentives. So I'll be interested in your thoughts on whether that works out here. So I'm quickly gonna go through these um, three studies, lots more information um, available in our discussion period, or, um, or I'm happy to follow up with you afterwards. This study was conducted by RAND, um, very rigorous study looking at uh, 63 large companies and basically comparing the behavior and the outcomes for two groups, those enrolled in a high deductible plan and those enrolled in a traditional plan. And rather than asking them what they would do, they looked at what actually happened with the um, claims data coming out of the purchasing decisions of these two groups. For nine common outpatient services, this includes an office visit, a colonoscopy, a chest x-ray, and what they found was that when all was said and done, eight of those nine services showed no difference between the prices paid by those with a high deductible and those with traditional plans and the proportion of low cost versus high cost providers they went to. The office visit showed a very tiny um, difference of 2%. And the authors concluded that this really showed that even though there are incentives to shop, uh, consumers really don't have access to that information that would help them do that. The CalPERS uh, reference pricing initiative, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but in case you're not, the situation was that CalPERS had uh, an analysis done of their orthopedics costs and found that their range of hospital payment for a hip and knee went from 15,000 to 115,000. And they partnered with Anthem Blue Cross to create a PPO product that basically would address this issue by taking all of the hospitals in the state and cutting out those that had fewer than 10 hip and knee replacements for CalPERS members over the last year, and then taking the remaining 63 and putting them on a distribution by the cost that they, uh, that PERS was paying for hip and knee. And they found that 47 of them were on um, cost 30,000 or below. And they made that the reference price. So the individuals, the PERS members who got a hip and knee replacement at one of those designated providers paid their standard cost sharing and had their standard out-of-pocket max. And those who chose to go outside of that reference price network paid in addition to that the full cost of the difference. So if they went to a hospital that charged 60,000, they paid their standard out-of-pocket max plus $30,000. What they found was, as Mary Beth alluded to, uh, that both enrollees voted with their feet 
and they switched from the higher cost to the lower cost providers, and that those hospitals, especially those uh, in the high cost group, dropped their prices. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, PERS saved $3 million, which for PERS is rounding error. Um, but <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very significant success story <clears throat> and has a lot of potential for adoption from others and for expansion. And in fact, PERS is now reference pricing colonoscopy, arthroscopy, and cataract surgery for 2012. Then I wanted to turn briefly to what I'm calling information without incentives. And here the case is New Hampshire, and New Hampshire developed the health cost website database. They have an all-payer claims database underlying this website, and it provides provider-specific insurer-specific median cost information, which is pretty solid, pretty detailed information on these 30 common conditions. Um, but of course, they don't have that front end of ben benefit design and network design of the individuals. Um, what they have found is that there's very low usage on analysis that the cons uh, Center for Studying Health System Change did. However, they did note some significant market effects of the website, including that there is evidence that providers are re reducing their prices uh, in negotiations. And this one, I think, is particularly interesting, that, there, um, that some of the market players in New Hampshire are using the information from that database to inform the development of tiered networks and are then um, going to use that network to steer consumer behavior so that, in effect, potentially the uh, database does have a non-trivial effect on consumer behavior, but it's indirectly mediated through industry. So I'm going to shift gears now um, as we're going to just leave that one in a box and turn to the purchaser audience. And consumers are really all about me, but purchasers are really all about my population and all about the global kind of bottom line. Um, and so what does this look like for them? Uh, in the market broadly, we're seeing a shift away from unit price and toward total cost of care. This is slow and it's painful, sort of a three steps forward, two steps back kind of thing. But historically, our fee-for-service model is really focused on unit price, maximizing revenue, and basically shifting costs around. Whereas now what we're seeing is the emergence of new models, in particular uh, accountable care organizations, which are really taking off in California. And those align the financial incentives among the provider so that Everyone has a shared incentive to achieve common cost and hopefully quality as well targets. And that just shifts the entire dynamic um, from arguing about internal negotiations to jointly coming up with solutions to cost issues. However, it is very challenging to capture the total cost picture for what's actually happening with costs. There are so many different streams, and the market is so fragmented. Uh, and so Mary Beth asked me to talk a little bit about IHA's efforts on um, total cost of care, which we at IHA are now collecting for the HMO POS population in California. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes, uh, show you a few high-level slides on total cost of care, and then um, wrap up on the purchaser perspective. So essentially, this uh, is a one slide story uh, of IHA's pay for performance um, program, which has evolved uh, from a beginning of quality based to now a value based payment approach. And back in 20, 2003 was the first measurement year. Um, and that was uh, all quality measures. 2007, there was enough confidence in those measures that then the plans began to pay the physician organizations based on the results. Again, all quality. And then in 2009, we introduced appropriate resource measures. 2011, total cost of care measures. And this year, 2013, we're implementing the value-based um, pay for performance. And that also is on your resource list, an issue brief that gives you much more information about that. The thumbnail is that there are gates uh, sort of thresholds for both cost, uh, total cost of care trend and quality in order for physician organizations to qualify for shared savings. And then those shared savings are determined by their results on appropriate resource use measures adjusted for quality. So that's essentially been a pretty dramatic transition over the life of the P4P program towards a much more global, much more total cost uh, and total quality perspective. 
I am not, I'm sure you're happy and I'm happy too, gonna go into the details of the total cost of care measurement, but I am happy to answer questions about this or find you someone who can. <laughs> This just shows a high level total cost of care regional variation. <clears throat> the blue, the light blue line that goes all the way across the screen is the statewide variation. Um, I'm sorry, the statewide average for total cost of care. And then each of the five geographic regions are shown um, along the, uh, the x-axis. And you can see, you know, I won't go into it, Mary Beth already covered this, that there's really dramatic variation by geography across the state with Inland Empire on the left with the lowest total cost of care and Sacramento Bay Area on the right with the highest. We can then overlay that on each of these points is one physician organization in the state. We can overlay that with quality. And on the, um, this chart has total cost of care per member per year on the x-axis and the y-axis is showing a quality composite. That incorporates clinical quality, meaningful use of health information technology and patient experience. And when you line those up, and again, each of the uh, dots is one physician organization. The color coding is geography. You can see that the correlation is uh, in line with the, what the literature tells us pretty weak between total cost of care uh, and quality. It's very slightly positive, but, uh, but clearly not a strong correlation. And this uh, just shows the actual numbers by geography for measurement years 2011 and 2012 total cost of care trend in the last two measurement years <clears throat> is all the way to the right with an aggregate statewide total cost of care um, trend of just under 5% for the whole population. But as Mary Beth mentioned, really dramatic differences in the uh, trend across the different geography, um, geographic regions of the state. And then this is, um, uh, this is showing in pairs of years. So 2008-9, 9-10, 10-11, 11-12, just to make it easier to see the change in the trend in each of the past four dyads of years. You can see we hit almost an 11% trend year over year in the 2008-9 um, dyad in the most recent year, 11-12, uh, for which we have data. Again, we're just under 5%, so you can see that changing over time. So. How can the cost data be used? We've already talked a little bit about performance-based payment, using it to set targets and create rewards. It also clearly could be used, as Mary Beth mentioned, for reducing variation, can find hotspots and address them. Um, regulatory oversight, negotiation, we talked a little bit already about steering and tiering, and research. I do want to point out, though, and take the opportunity to link back to that first portion of the presentation around the consumer piece, that what's not on this chart is informing consumer decision making, because they don't care. That's just not their thing. Purchasers care a lot, and the consumers, not so much. So when you're thinking about what is it that these two groups really want to know, it's really important to be thinking about what the specific needs are of that audience and who's got that data. I'm just gonna make one final quick note, which is this is uh, something that IHA has um, learned over the years. And it is, I think, a really salient point to make as there are so many efforts gearing up across the state to provide data uh, to different audiences in a, in a widely available um, sort of a, of a structure, database, or interface. And that is that the use of the information really dictates the standard of reliability. And so, for example, when you're thinking about what is the standard of reliability and what are the political and legal challenges involved in, you, in providing data that are for internal performance use, either to identify um, docs who are on an outlier on quality or an outlier on cost, well, that's pretty low. That's not going anywhere except internal to the physician organization or just to that doc, him or herself, perhaps showing that doc data on their own performance compared to their peers. But if you take that same data and you put it up on a website, that's a totally different ballgame 
Public reporting requires a much higher standard of reliability. Uh, you really um, have the potential to impact people's livelihoods. You have the potential to generate a whole array um, of both legal and practical difficulties. And it's really incumbent upon all of us to make sure that those data are, um, are solid and accurate. And so at that, um, I think Adams is going to solve all those problems for us. Um, and I will turn it over to him. Uh, thanks to everyone in the audience for braving the weather to get here. The uh, frostbite ward is on the 13th floor. Um, uh, and an aside, but relevant to the overall conversation, uh, so the ward will be staffed by myself. I'm a critical care physician. I see Patrick Romano here. I'm sure he'll kick in an emergency. He's an internist. Um, however, uh, we have no idea what the charges are going to be. Um, you'll just have to wait for the, or you could have your credit card ready or wait for the bill in the mail. Um, so, uh, lots of use cases. Um, and, and Jill mentioned the difficulty of making this actually happen. And so I'm going to talk about um, some of that. The, the, a fundamental issue is that the data you need to be able to tell people how much things are going to cost um, and how much things have been costing um, is very uh, sensitive data. And so you have to set up a system that can manage that data in a way that, that um, achieves the desired intent, um, but at the same time ensures uh, uh, privacy of the data and, com and com gives everyone else in the system confidence that the uh, system is being managed well. So <clears throat> we actually had a, a conference at UCSF uh, to talk about this in October. And uh, we went through the use cases that uh, Jill laid out and, and then some of these governance issues. And so I'm going to talk to you about the governance issues now. Um, uh, just a little bit about what an all-payer claims database is. As that, that, that's one of the necessary pieces. It probably won't be sufficient, but it's one of the necessary pieces that's been difficult to put together. Um, and then we'll go over alternative structures for the group or organization that, that or manages uh, the database um, and give examples from other states so we can know how people are doing this and don't have to entirely reinvent the wheel and talk through options for California. So an all-payer claims database is uh, a database that takes uh, preferably from all insurance companies and then add, commercial insurance companies and then adds in uh, government databases. Um, all the claims that are that are coming in uh, for the cost of care, so that one can do some of the purposes that Jill was talking about, um, uh, whether it's calculating total cost of care for a typical case or getting down to the granularity that one needs to um, tell a consumer what it is that um, they've spent already and and uh, what they'd pay net for the next um, episode of care. Um, uh, so uh, if we can now just imagine that we're going to create something like that, I'm going to focus for the rest of my time on, well, how would you manage it? Because that's actually uh, something that there isn't a set um, legal structure for here in the state. Uh, and there isn't yet agreement uh, on, a, a not, on a voluntary uh, basis as to how that should work. Um, so questions include, where would the all-payer claims database reside? Um, what are the restrictions on data use? And who uh, will be the group that oversees those restrictions uh, and uses? So some of the options for where the database would reside include uh, government departments. So we have a, a number of uh, government departments that already handle um, data here in California. Then uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, I think both Jill and, and Mary Beth mentioned um, uh, CHIPI, the California uh, Health System performance, uh, health care performance information system um, uh, is an example of a nonprofit organization or an academic center uh, could um, uh, take this. The, the uh, federal centers for Medicare and Medicaid services are uh, giving out contracts to state governments, and California has one of them. Um, and in those contracts, they're um, uh, restricting the use of the uh, the funds that are given out to creating uh, claims databases that are based either within government or at a nonprofit or an academic center. So it, the reason I say that is one could obviously imagine that for-profit companies could do this, but um, a lot of the resources that are available um, to create these are, are not, are, are specifically prohibited from going out to that kind of an organization. 
Um, so here are some examples of how other states are doing this. Um, I believe we're at 15 as of. That sounds good. Yeah, as of as of about two weeks ago, it was 15. Whether or not anyone's come up with something new I'd, uh, in the last two weeks, I'm not sure. But um, uh, in Colorado, they've created a nonprofit organization, the Center for Improving Value in Healthcare. In Kansas, they've got a government department. Uh, uh, that is in charge of it. In Maine, it's another nonprofit, and so forth. You see that um, the majority of the models out there have been uh, government as the custodian of the data, um, but there definitely are, um, are alternatives. Um, here in California, we have uh, the Office of Statewide um, Health uh, Planning and, and Development that um, uh, already receives data about every hospitalization, for instance. So they're already receiving a, a, a fair amount of data uh, about that's protected health information um, uh, and uh, is, is of the similar ilk, not, not all the claims data, but similar kinds of data already being received. Uh, the Department of Healthcare Services and the Department of Insurance are both um, trying to uh, uh, put together the resources and the management plan for, for um, an all-payer claims database. And there's the Center for Health Statistics. Um, there's also CHIPI, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned, an academic center or other healthcare research organization could, um, could manage the data. So after you put someone in charge, you're going to have to put some, uh, create some rules that that group has to live by. Some of them are um, uh, federal rules that we all have to live by whenever anyone is touching this kind of data. So HIPAA is an example of, of a rule that, we, that everyone uh, involved with this kind of data has to follow. Um, there may be state level restrictions on the use of protected health information. And then you might want to have uh, in, in legislation, or alternatively, you would want to have it in the bylaws of the organization, some statement of the, of the intended purposes, and also what to do if there are requests that don't clearly hit exactly what those purposes are. And there are different examples of how restrictive people have been, or states have been, in their approaches to this. So in Minnesota, data release is solely um, uh, allowed um, by the state's um, provider peer grouping project. So that's the only, or only use for which data can be released. In Colorado, things are a little less restrictive, um, but there are some, very, uh, some careful specifics uh, about um, some types of information that can't be released. Um, and New Hampshire, actually, not on this slide, is the least restrictive of all. So they define what data has to be uh, collected. And then they, their rule for um, how it can be used is unless there's a specific prohibited use here, the department has to release it. So it's sort of turning it on the head from Minnesota. Minnesota is only for these stated uses, and New Hampshire is unless it's specifically prohibited. So uh, once you put some, you, you create some rules and you, um, and have a location where the data sits, you then have to ask, well, who oversees the following of the rules? And in general, you're going to want some committee that's going to uh, be responsible and through that accountability create confidence for the rest of the community that these things are uh, going to be managed well. And um, you can have different uh, makeup of the, the committee that, that um, is in charge of oversight. So uh, obvious um, potential groups from which you would draw would be consumer representatives, um, uh, pr providers, insurers, uh, oh, I should have had payers, employers on there, um, and, and government. And uh, again, we see different models in different places in the country. So in Maine, the, the group that oversees the use of the database has 20 uh, uh, members. Four of them have to be from consumer groups. Three have to be from employers, two from uh, third-party payers, that's insurers, and nine members, this is prescribed in the law, and nine members have to be providers. And then there are some additional members that may add to or uh, any of those groups. Um, in Kansas, as opposed to having um, uh, specifically laid out who the stakeholders are, uh, it's the, the Kansas Division of Healthcare Finance. So that uh, agency of government has uh, sole supervision of the database. Um, and you could imagine uh, either of these models, or, or even something on the main side, you could imagine something even more 
balanced in terms of its representatives. So you could say, well, there seem to be four stakeholder groups here, consumers uh, who want certain kinds of information, as Jill laid out, um, uh, employers and labor unions who buy health care and who are more interested in the total cost of care, um, and then the insurers and the providers. So if there are those four groups, you could imagine setting, perhaps setting something up where they each get equal say. Um, <clears throat> But those are the questions that one would have to ask in terms of uh, setting up a committee to oversee the data here in California. So um, the, there are some um, additional issues that are going to be really important for how this uh, works out. Um, let's imagine that you could solve the first three location uh, 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 rules of use and, and governance. Um, uh, you then have to ask yourself, okay, well, if we've got bylaws for that, what's our plan for the long term for this? So um, we, have, we have to decide, um, do we want this to be a voluntary initiative where, given the rules that have been negotiated, people can choose to report or not report? Or is this something that should be mandatory? And we have examples of both of those in the California healthcare industry. So um, OSHPID does um, uh, reports, for instance, about mortality rates for certain procedures or conditions, and those are mandatory. Uh, every hospital has to submit the data that is uh, from which the reports are generated, um, and, and there's, there's no option. Um, on the other hand, um, IHA, where Jill works, is an example of a, an organization that's generating information about performance in healthcare that's entirely voluntary. Um, and uh, so we have successful examples of both here in California and uh, have to consider the, the advantages and disadvantages of each. Um, second big issue is um, even if you could start something successful today, it's highly unlikely that uh, the, the need is going to stay static over time. What, exactly what that need is will, will probably change over time. And there's a trade-off that's going to, uh, that ought to be explicitly addressed as you're setting up what the rules are today in the sense that the more narrowly you define them, the the, the benefit of narrowly defining them, I should say, is that it's clearer to everyone exactly how are these data going to be used, exactly how are they going to be controlled, et cetera, but that may make it more difficult for new uses to evolve over time. An example of that already exists here in the state. So Calif California state government already collects a lot of information from hospitals, as I mentioned. Um, but that information, the uses for that information are so narrowly defined that California state government couldn't take all that data right now and turn around and create something like uh, uh, a, a price database from the information that they currently get, or a total cost of care database from the information that they currently get, because that's not um, in their uh, defined authority. Um, and then, of course, there will be the issue of uh, the cost to develop and maintain whatever it is that, that we create. So um, if it's a, a government program, um, uh, and, the, and data uh, comes in through the government, then that, for instance, may make it more difficult f for that evolution to happen um, because it, it becomes difficult for government to figure out how to change their revenue stream to match changing needs. Um, alternatively, if it's a voluntary program, what's the mechanism for developing a, the revenues and for covering the cost to develop and maintain the program? Uh, so I'll stop there, and I think we're going to have a question and answer session, and by all means, Go for it. For uh, Dr. Adams, you mentioned that uh, the Department of Insurance and um, DHCS is looking for uh, resources to put together a database. I don't know if you have any more information that you can expand on that. What, what, what exact resources are they looking for and what, what are they trying to accomplish? Well, I'll give you an, an example. Um, so the uh, DOI or CDI has um, uh, California Department of Insurance sorry, has uh, obtained a grant from um, CMS, the federal agency, uh, for, um, I believe it's $5 million? 5.2. 5.2 million dollars um, uh, for creating an all-payer claims database. That's part of the national program um, to try and get some of this information out. Um, and that probably sounds like a lot of money, and it certainly would go to some uh, you know, to some benefit. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's not currently any clear provision for um, continuing the funds or the funding 
after the time period of the contract. So it's not clear then what would, what would happen next. Um, and it's not known whether or not that's sufficient. And that's just the money side of it. Then there's the question, uh, they have to go through the questions that I was just talking about. Um, and one of the issues would be, um, how do I get the data that, that enters into it? So even if they had all the money in the world and, and all the right people in place to, uh, uh, to manage the data if they were to get it, um, then they still have the problem. They don't have the authority to mandate that the data be submitted from insurers or employers that one would need to do this. So what's the mechanism by which they get that other crucial resource, which is the information that populates the database? Does that make sense? Uh, hi, Brett Johnson with the California Medical Association. Um, and I saw in a number of these slides there was comparisons between, you know, San Francisco and other localities. Um, but, I mean, anybody who's, you know, dealt with uh, medical providers, I mean, the cost of running a medical practice in San Francisco and the Bay Area is much higher than a lot of those other locales. So I'm just wondering if, if you've ever seen data that was adjusted for the cost of doing business, or is that something that anybody's tried? Um, and then on the question of all-payer claims databases or, or the issue of all-payer claims databases, um, you know, my understanding is in a lot of these states that kind of one of the biggest hurdles is that who's going to pay for it, the funding mechanism, and are there any that you've seen that you think would work best in California or uh, any suggestions on that front? Um, so in terms of the, the total cost of care measure, um, you're quite right, and, um, and IHA does geography adjust the data. We uh, present it different ways to different audiences. Um, and, you know, I think it's a really interesting question about whether you should geography adjust the data or that's part of why the costs are really different. Um, but the geographic adjustment does not remove the differential um, uh, total cost of care. That does not erase it. It, it um, it dampens the variation slightly, but it by no means removes uh, that. And the slide I handed out, um, uh, I'm sorry, the slide I sort of skimmed over, but it's in the packet on the total cost of care measurement provides some detail about that. It's also number seven in your uh, resource list is an issue brief on how that measurement is done. And we are in the process of updating that because it's now a couple of years old and we've learned a lot from it that we haven't had a chance to really write down and document. Uh, but there is a geographic adjuster in the measure as well as a risk adjuster. And I'll let Adams take the other. So Fun, th th there are a ton of different funding options, so it depends on where it sits. So if it's going to be in government, presumably the funding would be um, either through the general fund or some sort of charge that government lays on insurers or uh, providers. Um, uh, if it's um, not in government, if it's in some outs outside organization, they might be able to get some of the funding, for instance, through the CMS contract with uh, the California Department of Insurance, as an example, or some other government, you know, performing some services for, for the government for contract. They also presumably would have to justify the serve, you know, their costs and be able to take them from the industry. I don't think consumers would ever pay for something like this, but uh, you laugh, right? <laughs> consumers are not going to pay for something like this. I'll make a stronger statement. Um, uh, so they'd have to be able to, that organization would then have to be able to um, uh, build a case to insurers and perhaps to employers that they were providing an important service and, and then get um, payment for doing that. And we have had examples of those already existing in California. IHA is an example. Uh, Chart um, is an example where the industry is paying for um, hospital performance measurement. Um, so that, that can happen. Uh, I will just add one small note to that, which is there is a d definite market and a lot of entrepreneurial activity around linking consumers with price data, for example, Castlight or Change Healthcare, and those are organizations that are basically selling their services to employers primarily, and the employers buy the service that Castlight or Change Healthcare is providing, give them all the employee level data that they need, and get their health plans to turn over all the negotiated rates so that those organizations have all the data they need to provide that consumer-facing website. So when the consumer goes to that website and wants to get information on their specific 
benefit network and so forth, it's right there because of what has happened on the back end. And the reason that those employers are willing to pay Castlight or Change Healthcare to provide that service is because if they can get their consumers, their enrollees to be more cost conscious, we're back to the total cost of care motivation. That employer is going to see savings. Um, so I think there is a business model on the consumer information side, but the consumers are definitely not going to pay for an all-payer claims database. Yeah, so if we look at what other states have done, I think it's a combination of all three of those. Sometimes it's been paid for with general fund money. A lot of the startup has been paid for by federal grants, either through um, establishing the exchange grants or things like, as Adam's just described, the um, uh, rate review grants that were just issued. So there have been, I think, a hodgepodge of different funding mechanisms, and we'd probably have to look to something like that in California as well, a combination of sources. Okay, Anne McLeod, California Hospital Association. Probably a few more uh, comments as opposed to question um, I wanted to let you know, we actually identify several major cost drivers that weren't included on the slides earlier. Um, hospital costs are really affected by the uniqueness of the communities that they serve, which is why they vary. Um, there are microeconomies, workforce availability, geographical differences, and demographics of all the patients served, uh, the level of discount and charity care provided to the uninsured and underinsured, or their share of the patients covered by public programs that have very, very low reimbursement rates, such as Medicare and Medi-Cal. All those impact cost, and those um, weren't on the sheet. Cost drivers also include societal benefits, such as physician education programs, important research functions that actually result in clinical best practices that could increase the quality or decrease the cost for the entire system. These uh, are services that have, as I said, a great societal benefit. However, they are costs that purchasers don't want to recognize or pay for when making those purchasing decisions. But we can't let those escape our thought process as we develop something. Much of the discussion that we see around price transparency seems to be really be embedded in a fee-for-service world uh, that fails to address these cost drivers. Hospitals and others and policymakers certainly recognize the need to move to population health with more aligned incentives, which quite frankly makes price transparency on widgets obsolete. So I think we have to be careful about what we're trying to do. And, and just to reiterate, if there's going to be a concerted focus on price, then it must coincide with a concerted effort from all of our policy leaders on recognizing the costs of the entire system and find ways uh, to identify appropriate ways for paying for them. Otherwise, what we will be confronted with is unintended consequences of well-intended policy gone awry. Thank you. Thanks. Um, actually, let me just make one comment, because I agree, I think there are lots and lots and lots of drivers, but I would argue that having price transparency and having better information about all of those components would really help us versus having it obscure and difficult to understand. So if we had better information about all of those elements and understood where different hospitals and other kinds of providers stood on those different elements, I think it would be really, really helpful. So again, I think uh, moving forward would be the, beneficial. This is the distinction that Mary Beth's making is is to move is that that would be a move from implicit subsidies that no one can understand or follow or mm -hmm. track to explicitly saying what the costs are of all the things that that um, which are legitimate costs that that you laid out and uh, and coming up with some better way to uh, fund those and and, I, and the system will break down if we don't so um, we have to. You can't just say that there are people who aren't going to pay and the hospitals are responsible for that. You, you have to figure out some way of dealing with that. My name's Jay Hansen, and the, the hat with this question is uh, as a school board member here locally. You know, we have a unique uh, opportunity, I think, because, and I think this exists in government period, where you have groups of employees who negotiate with the employer, and they both have a financial interest in trying to keep the cost as low as possible. We have 5,000 employees and we're providing health care for 10,000 people and our costs are going up dramatically every year. Do you have any instances or cases that you know of here in California where local government or state government or school boards are working with their employed, you know, the unions, and trying to figure out ways to capture the cost data and try to work together to keep the cost down where they're you know, working both with the same goal? 
Uh, yeah, so so there are some uh, the uh, California Healthcare Coalition is a organization. I may characterize them. Just on the okay, sorry. Um, the California Healthcare Coalition is a uh, statewide organization that uh, includes in its membership um, many uh, government, particularly small government uh, uh, purchasers and uh, labor union purchasers, um, and uh, has been doing, and, and at least some of its members have been doing uh, interesting things looking at their claims. Um, and, and trying to work even to the point of working with local providers to uh, explain that they see a, a wage health benefit trade-off going on for people in their communities. And so they talk sort of community, and you would be in a great position to do this, you know, school board talking to, to local providers, what can we do so that we don't pinch the people who work at the schools more? Um, you know, we want to do the health care that's right and necessary and high quality, and we want to pay a fair price for it, but we want to make sure that, that we're not doing extra or, or paying extra because that comes out of teacher salaries, for instance. That kind of discussion is very compelling. Um, and if you'd like, afterwards, I can uh, connect you to some folks who are, who are trying to do that, trying hard. Right. I think we've got a question over here. Hi. Helen Roth Dowden. Um, I have a qu just a question. Are you saying that you need legislation in California in order to set up the uh, all uh, payment uh, claims database? Well, so legislation is one of the options. Um, so um, we have had, and Jill is part of, a very successful, there's no legislation supporting IHA, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wish, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, so we have had very successful um, voluntary initiatives. Um, we've had also had some voluntary initiatives that didn't succeed as much, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and uh, and so there and there may be a penetration issue that um, even successful voluntary initiatives may not get everyone to volunteer, uh, and so you may end up with either geographic pockets or certain um, certain providers that are not uh, included in a voluntary initiative. So that's the downside of voluntary. The upside of voluntary is that. You start when you start. You don't have to wait until there's legislation, and you may be able to get somewhere at least, um, even without legislation. So uh, I think I can't think of any voluntary initiative that has been universal. Um, can, can can either of you? No, and neither IHA nor yeah, Chart is universal. Right. So. The California Healthcare Foundation's uh, soon to depart uh, CEO Mark Smith always says there is no universal voluntary anything. Um, there isn't. Uh, by definition, if it's voluntary, there are people who are going to choose not to participate. Um, but we have had some initiatives in California. One example that Adams and I are both very familiar with is the Chart, which was the the hospitals coming together to report quality measures, um, which started about seven years ago or so, and the effort there, I mean, it was interesting. The hospitals that chose to participate initially were those that were in competitive markets that needed to participate. But we never got 100% of the hospitals to participate um, because those in small rural areas or that weren't in competitive markets, just they didn't have the need and didn't see the benefit of providing resources to an effort like that. So, so I think when you have voluntary, you're always going to have um, a subset of participants, and it's usually those participants that are bigger, larger, more well-financed. Um, and so you get just one picture of the care that's delivered, but it's not comprehensive at all. I think, want to add I, anything, Joe? For P4P, we do have all the, um, we have statewide HMO POS numbers. So. That is, I mean, it's a subset of. But they're all the large medical groups. You don't have the small one and two that don't participate in managed care contracts for the most part. Right. It's all the plans. It is not all. All the, the providers. Got right. it. It's not every physician in the state, but it is all the plans. Right. So, to the best of my knowledge, there's no voluntary initiative that would serve every California consumer. There has been no voluntary initiative that would have served every yeah. California consumer or even every insured California consumer. On the other hand, the voluntary initiatives have been able to get to important things faster than some of the mandated initiatives. So in chart, um, uh, California became the first state in the country to report uh, patient experience using a survey that had been developed federally, paid for federally, and then just kind of sat there 
with no one using it. And when it was implemented, and, and part of the argument for no, that led to no one using it at the, Fed, at the national level was it's too hard to do. It's you know, too hard to get the hospitals to agree, too hard to implement, et cetera, until 200 California hospitals got together and implemented it. And then that argument fell away. And two years later, it became part of what Medicare does. So voluntary can goose, and now it's mandatory through Medicare. So voluntary can goose mandatory, um, and, and yet it's not ever going to be universal. I mean, we have... Right. To compel, I think, all of the, uh, the submission of all the data, there are some states that have all payer claims databases, which I'll say are actually multi-payer claims databases because they have plans that don't participate uh, or they don't have their Medicaid program in or other things. So I think if we want 100 percent of the claims, then we really do need legislation in order to force them. In, in my house, we have uh, voluntary, nearly universal dish clearing after dinner. <laughs> um, but um, in the absence of some sort of oversight, which can be costly, um, <laughs> there, there would be a pile of dishes on the <laughs> kitchen table right now. So uh, you know, there, there are trade-offs. And sometimes I trade off to the voluntary side, and I don't put the effort in, or my, my wife doesn't put the effort in. And other times, the dishes get in the dishwasher. I don't know which is right now. So Karen, Bob? Dave. Oh, right. But um, Ruth is next, I oh, think. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Ruth Holton Hudson with the State Controller's Office. Um, we sit on PER, so we're really happy about the reference pricing. Um, but what else can large employers, because it seems to me that's really where some of the leverage points are, can really do to help move the envelope towards uh, price transparency? Well, one thing that many large employers are indeed doing is shifting costs to um, their employees in one way or another. So even though we're still not seeing a huge increase in high deductible plans in California, there is movement in that direction. There's movement toward PPOs away from HMOs. So I think the benefit design question is definitely pr beginning to provide as Jill divided consumers into those with incentives and those without. And even those with incentives, we don't see a whole lot of price shopping going on unless you have really strong incentives like the hip and knee replacement at CalPERS. Um, so I think it's really difficult to get consumers engaged even with benefit design differences. But I'll let Jill tickle that. Yeah, I would just add that um, that I actually think employers can do a lot more. I do um, on behalf of employees. I think that there are um, things they can do without just shifting their employees into high deductible plans. And I think that really sort of enlightened, savvy employers are are doing those things. They're figuring out what works to lower costs, and they're implementing those things either. In, and there's a whole array of initiatives out there with enormous sort of variation um, and a lot of really exciting things going on um, because there's not going to be one thing. There's not like, oh, you should do this because that's going to work. Some are doing on-site clinics. Some are doing um, exclusive providers, direct contracting. There's a huge array. Um, but and many are doing these contracts with places like Castlight or Change Healthcare or the many other options that are out there to really arm their employees with information to help them shop. Because as, as Mary Beth noted, um, the, it's that combination of the information and the incentive. So just sticking them in a high deductible just leaves them hanging out there. Um, but giving them the information, that's a really powerful tool. But you can't give them the information that isn't really easy. You all know how busy it is. You're not like, gee, I'd like to go to 12 different re you know, websites and try to find information on 12 different providers for services that no one can really give me any information about. That is really a non-starter. It needs to be easy. And for the most part, we're not there yet. And even the cast lights and the change healthcare. That's a propri those are proprietary. You can't sign up for Castlight as an individual. It's not available. Your employer buys that for you. So I think there are lots of different things that employers can do, and I think that there is more energy um, uh, gaining around this price transparency thing. On your resource list, uh, number five is the report that Catalyst for Payment Reform recently did on price transparency tools and how they look out there. Um, and I think we're going to hear more and more about this, not less. There are some other really important things that large employers could do, for instance, or any employer could do. Um, for instance, a common refrain that, that uh, is heard around the state um, from insurers with respect to any of these transparency initiatives and why they aren't paying for them and making them happen is, 
our customers aren't asking for it. And so if this is an important um, issue, then in, uh, employers have to make it clear to their, the, their, the insurers that, that they are asking for it. Um, uh, and then they could also, remember there are at least two types of price transparency that Jill mentioned. There's the one about what do I, the consumer, pay now for this next thing that I'm considering. And there's also the total cost of care transparency. Um, em, uh, employers and really everyone could say, well, I want an all-payer claims database. I also want the line-by-line -line claims so that I can do things like your school board might want to look at the biggest claims. and 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 take them to the to the um, the provider and say, hey, let's talk about this. Why does that implantable cardi cardiac defibrillator cost one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars? And actually, if you did that for very long, you'd discover that that sometimes it's one hundred and fifty thousand and sometimes it's thirty thousand, and that's two whole teachers, right? So, uh, at least at the beginning level, um, and so uh, so you know there are, there are important steps that about just demanding the information, creating the demand for the information that employers could could take. And also labor unions who purchase on behalf of their members, they shouldn't be left out too. They're very important and often can really tell compelling stories. And just one other quick note on that. PERS is also a leader on the ACO front with Sacramento-based ACO that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with Shield and Hill Physicians, Blue Shield of California and Hill Physicians. That is, you know, that is aligning incentives, and that has shown really strong results. I believe CHCF commissioned an evaluation on that. CHCF did commission an evaluation, which I'm hoping we're going to release in January, so on three years. So there, were, there was a lot of um, uh, information about the first year of the CalPERS ACO, and so now we actually have three years of experience with CalPERS ACO. So Here, here's another thing. we'll do another briefing on that in January. Here, here's another thing that uh, uh, employers could push for. Um, believe it or not, it's hard often for employers to get their own claims back, and it's really hard for employers to know if they've got say they offer three health plans. Um, it can be really hard for them to even get an answer from the health plan, how do you pay the hospitals in my community? Do you pay them discounted charges? Do you pay them a per diem rate? Do you pay them uh, DRG? Um, so, so insurance business um, arrangements are actually hard to get, and that's a situation, again, because the customers haven't demanded it. So if the insurers felt like that was really important to the customers to understand, and so back to your school board efforts, you know, it, it's going to matter a lot how you approach the providers if you pay per day in the hospital or if you pay for that device that's $150,000. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question. Who's yeah, uh, Robert David from Oshpit. Actually, it's funny, I just uh, got an email. Uh, there's a story in the Washington Post today. Does knowing medical prices save money? CalPERS experiment says yes. Yes. So, <laughs> Yay! Great time. How timely. I've been looking at this slide, total cost of care by region, and I'm, you've combined Orange County and San Diego, which are really separate markets. Um, but uh, I'm curious, because San Diego is a very consolidated health care market, mm -hmm. um, provider market, and why, if indeed their prices are lower, what, you know, is the intensity of services lower? Is it a healthier population? What, what would be, what's your analysis? Uh, the the geography, you're quite right. You may note also that the Central Coast, Central Valley, and North don't have a whole lot in common. Um, and it has more to do with what really kind of works from the perspective of the folks doing the P4P program from an operational standpoint. Um, so I think probably I don't have a great answer for you at that sort of um, level of detail. I think. Uh, I'd be happy to hook you up with the um, folks who are running the um, P4P data themselves, and you can dig in with them on exactly what the details are on the geography-specific results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there are there is a combination of forces at play. Um, you know, some of it's the underlying costs in the community. A lot of it is concentration. Some of it's health plan market power. So there are lots of those different elements at play. And it's heavily HML too, right? right. Heavily. Like the rest of the like most of them. Well, I think Orange County. Yeah. 
It, there are different rates, yeah, in different markets. And I think, um, in, like in Orange County, I think you've got lots of PPO stuff cropping up there now, more than um, there used to be, uh, as, as smaller employers that are located in Orange County are trying to get a control on their overall premium costs. So market dynamics are a balance of forces, and provider consolidation is only one of them. Um, one of the things that may be going on uh, is that a lot of those programs I mentioned with CHCC, the California Healthcare Coalition, um, that's the small government purchasers and the, uh, the unions, are down in San Diego. And so they're going to the two biggies down there and saying, let's talk about this. So that may be playing into it somewhat. Um, but, but you see unconsolidated places that, for whatever reason, are able to charge a very high premium, um, single hospitals that are able to charge very high premiums and so forth. So the reputational dynamics and the, and the consolidation and how much the, the, uh, the people on the purchaser side are willing to push back all play, all play into it. Um, uh, but one of the rationales for transparency is that um, uh, someone standing, you know, outside the earth and looking down on it and wanting it to be a fair place might say, gosh, should consumers in San Diego be getting a better deal? Because they effectively are. There's less of a wage health care trade-off there than there is in, in the Bay Area. Should they be getting a better deal just because they happen to be in San Diego? Or should we try to set up a system where the, the, the impact of those forces is exposed and and therefore more people can have uh, can potentially influence um, what goes on in healthcare pricing. Um, so that's a potential rationale for transparency. Oh, back here. Sorry. Um, I just had a uh, I guess a question. Or there was comments made that um, consumers are not price shopping, and and I guess my question is just. Isn't it the fact that you really need all of those elements? You need to be able to know what the price, is, price differentiation is, that there's quality, and that perhaps, you know, for many people, there has to be some incentive. Personally, if I knew that, that quality was the same, I'd be willing for the greater good to, to shop around for my MRI or whatever I was getting. But, you know, for many people, if, if you're giving them incentives, I know in, in our community, um, Safeway, a very large employer, has had tremendous gains just by providing some incentives for their employees. So I'm just kind of wondering, um, Dr. Yigin, I think, mentioned a little bit about employers doing that, but kind of what's the trend of, of that kind of thing happening? Yeah, let me just make one quick comment. So we did a, a study with the Cap, uh, Catalyst for Payment Reform, a nonprofit organization nationally. Um, and what they found was that about 97% of health plans offer tools that have quality and cost pricing information available to their subscribers. And yet they found only 2% of the members of those plans ever used them. And I think it really is to your point. So there are tools available. Those tools may not be good enough. They may not have precise enough information to really be helpful, but I think a lot a lot of people aren't even trying them. They're, they just, it, it's, it's all such a mystery, um, and they don't feel equipped to shop for healthcare services, and they don't see a relationship between price and quality. Um, and so we're just got, not getting any uptake at all. So you want to answer that, Joe? Yeah, no, I I agree. I think that's right. And, uh, and I think the other piece is sort of the magnitude of um, the incentive, you know. It, the, and people's price sensitivity to that incentive varies. So, it, you know, if you have more time than money, then you're going to be more interested to uh, shop and find, um, uh, put energy into finding the lower cost. If you are, um, you know, other people are not going to be interested in uh, making that effort for less than, you know, um, a much more substantial amount. So there's a lot of complex factors at play. The presentation of information piece uh, that I did not go into is just really also very important. Um, and I'm sure all of you have encountered just a horrible <laughs> navigation of website and you just give up. So even if you have great data and it's tailored and it's personalized and someone cares and they're motivated and they have an incentive and they show up and then they're stopped dead because boy, I cannot figure this out at all. All those things have to be clicking in order to really make it work. And I just think um, 
we're making progress, but by and large, you know, and and it's you know demonstrated by the numbers Mary Beth cited. We we aren't there yet. Plus, most people do, they just don't want to think about it. Almost all the time, they don't want to think about it. It's the same. I mean, who here has bought a bed in the last ten years? A mattress. Did you think about a mattress bef before? You know, the like the three weeks before you bought it. Had you been thinking about mattresses at all? Anyone raise your hand if you had been. So no one admits to having thought about it much before they realized they had. So you don't just go around collecting mattress information as you're going. And if you did, it would be a nightmare because they're constantly changing the names for the materials and stuff. And nobody has the same, even though it's the same bed manufactured by the same company, they give it a different serial number so you can't exactly compare. Well, all that same stuff would happen in healthcare. And people don't want to think about what if I got sick. That's how we have uninsured people with jobs. They just don't want to think about it most of the time. And then you say, oh, well, when do they think about it? Well, they think about it when they change jobs because they change insurance and they might have to change their doctor. They think about it if they um, get a, have a kid or something because they, they have to think about an obstetrician and then have to think about a pediatrician. Um, and sort of life forcing them to think about it things. Um, and, then they, and then they think about it when they get sick. But if you think about your mattress shopping that you did recently and imagine trying to do it while you were sick, okay? That would, that's what we're asking of uh, people to do a lot. Um, the other people, the people who might shop on a significant level over time are people with chronic diseases that don't make you feel terrible all the time. Um, they might have the time and energy to shop some more. But most people, most of the time, they don't want to think about it any more than they want to think about mattresses. And so they're not going to. And then when they do think about it, they're sick. And furthermore, you put on top of that, what if you didn't have to pay the full cost of the mattress? You only had to pay up to a certain amount. How much are you going to shop then? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a really hard nut to crack for a lot of people a lot of the time. Um, and that's why we talk about multiple uses of this data, is the way to um, make care the best that it can be for the best price that you can get it is to actually come at it from, from different angles and to have the purchasers who have to think about total cost of care every single year and the labor unions and the school boards, you know, trying to, trying to push on it all the time. And then if consumers also evidence, you know, we, we can identify situations like uh, hip surgery. So the thing about hip surgery is, that you don't think about for three weeks. That you feel coming for years and years. And, and, and you, you're deciding, do I do something about it or do, do I don't? And you've got time to shop and time to think. And if you wait another three months, it's not going to kill you. Whereas if you're having a heart attack, it is. So you know, there are a few specific shopping situations. And if we can make progress on those while also helping the, the um, people who are paying for the health care um, make progress on other fronts, then that's the most likely recipe for success. Okay, we're going to have to keep our answers short because we're going to try and fit two more in. Go ahead. So it seems like one of the rationales or the goals uh, being discussed is that price transparency will also hopefully not just reduce price or encourage competition, but reduce costs. And I think there's, a, and there's an assumption and there's a lot of folks who I think believe that price transparency is the magic bullet and is somehow going to get to the underlying costs and cost drivers and mentioned a number of them. So is that in fact a rationale? Are we saying that price transparency will reduce healthcare costs? And if so, what is the evidence available through all of these efforts that have been happening all over the country, voluntary, mandatory, or otherwise, that it is achieving that goal? Yeah, actually, I think it's a really good question. Um, I, I'll, I'll point to the article that I mentioned earlier that is in the resource packet about what happened when Medicare started to moderate its prices to hospitals. What happened was hospitals got more cost conscious and had to cut costs out. As I talk to hospitals now, they're very fo focused on cost containment because they see the ACA uh, cuts coming on the horizon and need to become more efficient. So in these cases, I think price transparency actually is leading to more cost-conscious behavior, um, simply because you know there's more pressure on what that upward bound of what people are willing to pay is, um, and so it's really helpful. The other thing I think has been, has been interesting. It would just be 
eating, they may just be eating a margin or whatever it is. They're what eating margin, but they're also there? there are layoffs in hospitals again this year, which there haven't been. You know, it's it's recession has caused some of that. But in the five years ago, six years ago, there was a nursing shortage. We weren't going to have enough nurses. Now we're laying off nurses. So I mean, I do think that this is a cyclical world that we're in. But more transparency is leading to a change in behavior and building in these payment incentives, ACO structures, those kinds of things are actually leading to providers becoming more efficient for the first time we've ever seen that. Um, we've, we see these cuts in health care cost rates are, have been going down. And it's been going down because I think providers are really looking at efficiency questions, which is wonderful. It's great. But even if it didn't go down, you want it to be more right. You want it to, and, and without transparency, without being able to see how others are doing, and I'm speaking as a provider now, to see how others are doing, how they're, are they getting the same outcomes I am for less money? That would be very interesting to me. And with all this information kept hidden, it's very hard to get to right. And if right means higher quality and, and a little bit higher cost, probably people could tolerate that. But being told, here's a ginormous bill for the total cost of care, and you can't see very well the quality and you can't see the elements of cost that's very hard for people to take and almost certainly it's not right there's almost certainly something that could be done better if we could have more information about it i would just rem i would just go back to that pers initiative example too just to you know in passing i mean you know there is the very little defense i think for that kind of variation for a fairly commoditized procedure and those hospitals lowered their prices. I mean, one can only hope they lowered their costs in line with it, but they probably don't have any business doing hip and knee replacement for $115,000. And that's an example, actually. One of the inputs in that is the prosthetic itself. And if you line up brands of, of hip and knee prostheses in Seattle and compare their prices in Seattle to the exact same thing in Vancouver, it costs four times in Seattle what it does in Vancouver. And price transparency might change some of that. So do we have one more we need to do? Or actually Oh, two more. Quick. Go ahead. Hi, over here. Um so I just given um, the title of today's presentation about the black box and where where the future is headed, I'm wondering about um, your thoughts collectively on um, how much uh, there the influence of things like Kaiser and, um, you know, how much of the California's markets are in um, capitated payment models and the, the trends toward more bundling and, and sort of different payment arrangements and what that'll do um, to the future of the movement toward price transparency, as you've laid it out here. Yeah, I think there's a huge amount of experimentation with new models and building in new incentives um, for providers to sort of look at different ways of doing business and doing things in a more cost-effective way. So um, I think there are two elements. You know, there's how we pay for care, and then there's how much we pay for care. So today we were kind of focusing on how much, but the how we pay for care is a really important element, too, because different models drive different kinds of behavior. Um, so uh, anything quick comments you guys want to make on that one? I will just say quickly that uh, IHA just finished a three-year project on bundled payment, a uh, demonstration project funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, a ton of information um, on our website. A really uh, complex question, and, and the question you're raising uh, is a really good one. Um, and, you know, I can't do it justice in 10 <laughs> seconds, seconds, so I'm not even going to try, but I'm happy to follow up with you. I would just add, even if we switch to, say, bundles, wouldn't it still be useful to have transparency about the price of the bundles? So there's, there's still a rationale, even if you're paying differently, for transparency about the new method of payment. And who's our lucky last questioner? Oh, Patrick Romano. <laughs> yeah, Patrick Romano. We'll be providing frostbite care. <laughs> yeah, right. Remember, charge unknown. Everybody's warmed up now. I guess it's a question for, for Jill um, re related to how IHI is trying to bring in this total cost of care component into your um, incentive um, payment system. Frankly, it, it, it seems a bit odd to me, um, and maybe it seems odd because so for quality measures, it makes sense that you don't want different plans giving conflicting signals to the same doctors. And there's also a big problem with the reliability data because they're based on patients with chronic diseases and there are only so many people with diabetes in each plan and so forth. But the numbers for prices are quite reliable and each plan knows the prices 
that it's paying. So it seems like a much more straightforward approach would be to create limited networks or to create a, a tiered network plan um, where if people chose more expensive medical groups, they would have a higher uh, contribution in some way. So wh why is it that you're bundling this uh, total cost of care into a quality metric as opposed to encouraging plans and employers to work together to use that information more, more directly in the market? Um, they are not mutually exclusive at all. So all of those things are happening and they should be happening and we're, you know, doing our best to support those efforts as well. Um, but basically, the total cost of care element and value-based P4P came out of this growing sense among the P4P participants and the plans that are basically paying the rewards to the physician organizations that things are looking really good on quality. Things are not looking so good on cost. And from the plan perspective, it got just very difficult to year over year pay out these rewards that actually links back to the other question on the capitation mode, right? And, and so these capitated provider organizations, physician organizations receive these rewards based on quality scores. Well, that's fantastic. But the price is just through the roof. So it was actually um, based on the feedback from our participating plans in particular were saying, you know, it really is critical that you all, IHA, work with your constituents to build in a component of cost so that we, the plans, can reward the physician organizations not solely based on quality, but based on their ability to manage the total cost as well. And so that's really where that came from. It's not at all inconsistent with what each of the plans are doing to create tiering and other kinds of incentive and network structures to incentivize the high quality, low cost provider organizations. It is basically just to make it a value-based program rather than just quality-based. And the key to that is that each of these plans only has the experience with the physician organizations. They're part of that business. But that physician organization has contracts with all the other plans. So what we can do is pull all that data together so that there is an aggregation of the total cost of care data for that physician organization for all of the contracted plans. Does that help? In, in fairness to IHA, too, it's easy to say, why don't you just create li narrow networks? But that there has not been a lot of acceptance of narrow networks among consumers and em employee groups oh, no. and so forth. So. Until covered California. <laughs> uh, well, we, yes. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Um, but you know, it's not like that was an easy thing. They were just forgetting to do. Um, it, that that has been tried, and there's been a lot of resistance to that. So um, I think again, it's an example of as many possible strategies as you can come up with. Okay. Thanks for sticking with us long, and thank you, panel. <laughs>